Y'all can be seated. Kyle, thank you, brother. I, um, I don't know that I even need to preach at this point. That was um, beautiful, man. I uh, appreciate your preparation and your time to bring us to the place of what we're celebrating here tonight uh, for Good Friday. So thanks, man, for your preparation. So good evening, everybody. My name is Chris. If you don't know me, I'm the associate pastor, one of the elders here at the Grove Church, and I have the honor and privilege to, privilege to be able to come and to bring the word to us tonight. And so um, this night is purposeful and, and intentional, and so I want to just dig right in tonight. So if you have a Bible, if you have an app on your phone or your device, I'm going to ask you to open that or to turn that app on and to go to Romans chapter 3. We're going to be in verses 23 through 26 this evening, so I'll give you just a minute to get there, to flip there. Uh, so Romans 3, verses 23 through 26. And as you're turning there, um, I just want to remind us tonight that um, we, we come to a night like this and it, it should feel heavy. Um, and the reason why it feels heavy is because somebody who was sinless and blameless took on our sin on our behalf on the cross. And we can't get to the celebration of Easter Sunday without walking through a hard night like tonight. And so my hope tonight is that um, we'd be able to lean on the words that God has given us in his scripture and that we'd be able to find um, some nuggets of truth to be able to cherish him more sweetly tonight as we, as we leave here. And so let's read together Romans three twenty three through 26. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. Take note of that. And that gift is through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance or his divine patience, he had passed over former sins and he did so to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So tonight I want to focus in on this word that we see in verse 25, uh, propitiation. That's kind of where I want to um, lead us to tonight and, and really... I think it's the crux of this passage, and really as we gather as believers on any Sunday gathering or, or any special service like a Good Friday or an Easter, um, it really it's we're coming to remember the death of Jesus Christ and we're celebrating it as people who believe. And that word propitiation really simply put means satisfaction. But on a deeper level, it means that it has this picture of averting the wrath of God by offering a gift. It means that Christ in his perfect life, his atoning work, his substitutionary death on the cross, that he satisfied the wrath of God not just against sin, but against us, his enemies. So his death on the cross didn't just assuage God's wrath against sin. It assuaged his wrath against us. And these are hard truths for us to wrap our minds around at times. And I think there's two reasons why it's difficult for us. And I think the first one is because inherently we have to deal with the fact that we worship and serve a God that has wrath stored up for his enemies. And that's hard. That's hard. Um, we, in our culture, want to paint God as just this loving, merciful, benevolent God, and he is those things, but we cannot get past the fact that he has a just wrath and anger towards sin and toward his enemy. The second thing is that um, there is a need to appease this wrath, and so let me give a little background for why Christ had to come in this way and why God had to put him forward as a propitiation for our sins. And then I hope that we see three things tonight as we dig into the text that we have a need for this satisfactory atonement. We have a need for this propitiation. The second thing is that we, there's an author to this. This didn't, isn't just something that happened. This was on purpose. And so we're going to look at who the author of propitiation is. And the third thing is that we're going to look at the nature of propitiation. 
So the background for propitiation as we see it in the Old Testament in the covenantal ceremonies and the sacrificial system that was set up for the people of God, the picture was is that when they would sacrifice an animal, the bloodshed of that animal um, that occurred in those sacrifices represented what sin deserved. And so when God confirmed his covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15... Animals were to be slaughtered, and that was to represent what unfaithfulness to God deserved among the people of God, and that was death. And then fast forward a little bit into Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11 with the Mosaic sacrificial system. We see that God says in verse 11 of chapter 17 of Leviticus, I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for life. So God, knowing his people would break his law, knowing his people would sin, in love and in grace provided blood sacrifice in order to turn away his just judgment from falling on them. He turned away his wrath and anger and put it on Jesus in order to assure that his continued fellowship with them would be intact and in order to cover their sins in his sight. Again, because he's holy, and sin is an offense to his holiness. And so we know that these sacrifices, though, were not sufficient enough payment for all sin, and so they would have to continually sacrifice again and again and again these animals to try to atone every time that they would fall out of step in keeping in line with God's law and God's command. And in Romans 3.25 that we just saw, we see that God put Jesus forward as a satisfactory atoning payment for our sin, the propitiation. And so what that indicates is that we have a need for this. So we have to ask the question, why is propitiation necessary then? And I think Really simply, in Romans 1, 18, the reason why is because God's holy wrath rests on evil. And we see that when it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And so the wrath of God, think about this, is pure and perfect hostility toward evil. We don't usually equate those things together. Wrath and anger towards sin as being pure and perfect. But in God, pure and perfect hostility towards evil is directed against all those who deliberately suppress what they know to be true and right in order to go their own way. In Romans 1, 21 through 23, it says, Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. And so if we look back to the garden, we see that Adam and Eve were created in the, glory of the, uh, in the glory of God and that they treasured him. So we, as a human race, we were created to treasure God. We loved God. We cherished him. We respected him. We were in awe of God. We worshiped him. We praised him. And we glorified God. And then we traded him. We traded him in for lesser things. And this is not just Adam and Eve. This is us. And this is why this night is heavy. Because we realize that. And if we don't, we should. That this is us. We traded God. We traded relationship with him away for the lie of a serpent that Stella read earlier. We've all done it. We do it every day. We embrace other values. We embrace other treasures. We embrace other desires. We've traded him. So when we put our job or our success ahead of treasuring and worshiping Jesus, then we've traded him. When we put our kids' activities ahead of treasuring and worshiping Jesus, then we've traded him in. Students, when you've given in to the desires and the temptations of your flesh or to try to meet the approval of your peers or you've tried to run your own race and diverge from the path that your mom and dad or those who are in authority over you are trying to guide you into a direction that's honoring to Jesus, then you've traded him. 
Or maybe it's when you take a really hard stand on your view on a mask mandate or who your favorite political candidate is, and you've taken a stand on those things harder than you've taken a stand on making sure that the gospel goes forth in your neighborhood and in the networks that you're in and the nations that are around us. And we've traded him in. We've traded him for lesser things. And so we lack God's glory because that's true. His glory is not our treasure. Sin is. His glory is not our treasure. And sin is anything that reflects that God is not our treasure. Romans 3.23 told us, tell, tells us that all have sinned and fall short or lack or have thrown away or have exchanged or have demeaned or belittled or trampled on the infinite value of the glory of God. And I want to make sure that I'm clear about something as I'm teaching tonight is that um, there's nothing unprincipled or unpredictable, or uncontrolled about God's anger. He's not some loose cannon. His anger is aroused by evil. It's aroused by wrongdoing. Um, it's aroused by evil alone. And since we're objects of his wrath due to our sin, we need an answer and a satisfaction for that wrath and that righteous anger to be satisfied. And it's either going to be in us, or in the Old Testament it was in an animal, and tonight, it's on Jesus in our place. So we're not fit to be that satisfying and atoning, perfect sacrifice. But Jesus is, and God knows this, and he has set up the system this way. He has authored propitiation in, in the way that he does. So we all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. We cannot pacify in ourselves or any sacrifice or any um, type of moral living. We can't pacify this righteous anger and wrath of God. We have no means whatsoever to do so in and of ourselves because we sinned and we stand completely helpless. And more so than that, Colossians 1 tells us that we stand as enemies. And we need to know that. We need to feel that. And that should fuel what's coming on Sunday in our worship and praise of our Savior who didn't just lie in a grave and end there. He rose and conquered sin and death. And we get there in a couple days. But God, two of probably the most beautiful words put together in all of Scripture, but God in his undeserved love has done for us what we could never do for ourselves. Jesus was put forward as a satisfying, satisfying, redemptive gift. So get this, that God is authoring propitiation, right? And so he is, the, the love, the idea, the purpose the initiative, the action, the gift were all his plan. Let, let, me, let me repeat that. The love that he has shown in sending his son in this way for you and I, the idea behind it all, the purpose with which he's pursued his enemies, the initiative that he's taken, the action that Jesus takes to come to earth and put this flesh on and live a sinless life so that he can be the perfect sacrifice to take on the wrath of God in our place. That gift, this is all God's plan. And since this is true, then we have to ask, what is the nature of propitiation? I think it's this, that God's own great love satisfied his own holy wrath Sorry. God's own great love satisfied his own holy wrath through the gift of his own dear son who took our place, who bore our sin, who died our death. So get this, that God himself gave himself to save us from himself. This was his own choice for our sake he became priest and sacrifice. He became mediator and gift in this act on the cross. We all are in need of a substitute since we're all guilty of sinning against a holy God. All of our sin deserves punishment by death. Romans 6.23 should come up on the screen behind me, but we probably know it, that it says, for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So because all sin is a personal rebellion against a holy God, and while we know animal sacrifices could not fully and rightly satisfy God's wrath, 
these sacrifices couldn't atone for our sin. Jesus Christ came and died in the place of his people. He became the substitution for us, taking upon himself the full punishment that we deserve. And so Kyle said a lot of this earlier, uh, but I'm going to repeat it, is that he willingly submitted himself to be betrayed. Being led away toward a wrongful trial, he submitted himself to that as well. He willingly became forsaken by his closest friends. He willingly suffered false accusation. We, he willingly went through a gross injustice. He stood silent while being mocked. He submitted himself to being slapped in the face by his own creation. He didn't defend himself against physical torture. He submitted to the mob that one week ago was shouting Hosanna and is now shouting crucify him. He submitted to the pain from a crown of thorns. He willingly drug his cross to the place that he would be executed. He submitted himself to being identified with criminals. He submitted to nails being driven into his limbs and was willing to take on the full weight of God's wrath for us. And this should land heavy on us because we put him there. And so as we come towards the close of our gathering tonight, I, I just wonder where we find ourselves, what we're coming in here with. Have you come in tonight to just check a box for one of the three or four gatherings that you'll attend on a, on, you know, a church throughout the year so that you can tell the Lord that like, hey, I made it. See, my good work's showing up. Maybe you're here tonight because um, your spouse wanted you here and you're just coming to be a support. Uh, maybe that's you. Maybe you're here because this is what your family does. We go to church, especially on the holidays. Um, maybe you've come here tonight disoriented and sad, hurting. Maybe you've come here tonight dealing with shame and guilt associated with sin. Or maybe you're here simply to remember and celebrate the events that make this truly a good Friday. I, I don't know what you're coming in with. But no matter what, where you find yourself, the reality is that we all come here needy and broken. And I find comfort in knowing that Jesus sees you exactly where you are. He knows exactly what you're dealing with. And I pray that he would illuminate in your hearts and mine and in mine the, the beauty of this night and the beauty of his sacrifice on our behalf. He came to save us. He came to justify those who have faith we saw in Romans. He declares that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because of what he's done for us on the cross. Jesus is both just and the justifier of those who have faith in him. So I hope that we leave here tonight as we dismiss in silence in just a little bit after our last song, recognizing our desperate need for Jesus. And like I said at the beginning, sweetly cherishing the cross of Christ and his satisfying atoning work on our behalf. As the band comes up to play for us, let's pray. Merciful God, who has pursued his enemies, his objects of wrath, with a perfect sacrifice. Lord, may that bring us to our knees and may it truly deepen our motivation to worship and to serve you, not out of duty, but out of just pure love and gratitude for what has been done for us. Helpless as we were, as separated as we were, you saw fit to bring us back into the fold. Thank you. God, I'm sorry my sin put you there. Help me to walk, help us to walk in a way that we live repentant and with faith. That's what the scripture calls us to. Not to perfection, to a life of repentance and of faith. And so God, help us to do that as we continue to walk with you. In your name we pray, amen. Would you stand with me? I wanna end a little differently this evening. Before our last song, I want to end with a responsive reading of some of the last few moments of Jesus.